It's really a great pleasure to be here for many reasons. Um, usually I'd say the weather, but in this case, not so much. Um, it's actually nicer in Illinois, believe it or not. Um, uh, but to celebrate this uh, wonderful center, which I hope I have the opportunity to visit. I've already got my desk picked out down there. Uh, and mostly to celebrate uh, the career of my good friend and mentor, John Clark. So I asked Irfan what I should talk about. And he said, well, just talk about something you did with John. And I said, well, how much time are you going to give me? Because that's pretty much everything I've done. <laughs> So I decided to talk really about, I'm going to talk a little bit about physics, but I'm mostly going to tell you stories, because this to me is really a celebration of what I learned from John, which is pretty much everything I know. And it's not just about physics. Uh, so my, uh, I almost called this talk A Tale of Four Cities, because I started out at The Ohio State University. I ended up at the University of Illinois, which is about 250 miles away. But in between, I had a couple of long uh, distance excursions to places, two places that John uh, holds very dear to his heart. One is Cambridge and the other is Berkeley. And both of those got me from where I started to where I am now. Uh, and to me, at least, it's a very interesting story of how I got there. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Now, I actually knew a lot about John Clark before I ever met him. Uh, I started my career as a graduate student at Ohio State University with a very excellent experimentalist, Jim Garland. Uh, this was in the early 1970s. Uh, and this was my first paper. It's a pretty boring experiment where we measured the uh, transport properties of tungsten. But we did so by using an interferometry circuit. And you'll notice the elements that make up part of this circuit. It's a couple of slugs. These are the slugs that John had invented at Cambridge. Jim brought back when he was a postdoc there. Uh, and I still actually have these. I was going to cool them down and see if they still work. I bet they do. Uh, and uh, this enabled us to measure the resistance of this very uh, a low resistance metal, about 10 to the minus 8 ohms, to a very high precision, and measured uh, voltages in the order of picovolts. So I was already using John's work. This is actually a line from the paper uh, using a uh, Clark uh, slug for these, this detector. Uh, so at Ohio State, my thesis experiment was on thermoelectric effects in superconductors, and I'm a little bit embarrassed, embarrassed to say that I did those measurements with SHE RF squid, which if you've been in John's group, you know an RF squid is not a squid. But, but it does measure very sensitive things. At this point, I did not drink wine or coffee. That'll become relevant later. But I did drink a lot of soft drinks. I won a NATO postdoctoral fellowship, and I went off to Cambridge. So at Cambridge, I worked with John Waldrum, real expert in the Josephson effect. I learned a lot from John. And I did this really nice experiment on thermoelectric generation of charge imbalance. Now, charge imbalance was something that was happening here at Berkeley at the time. John, uh, Mike Tinkham, a number of other people were developing these concepts about non-equilibrium effects in superconductors. And uh, they had measured how a charge imbalance resistance occurs when you put a current across an NS normal superconductor interface. We applied a heat current, since my thesis had been on thermoelectric effects, and saw the same thing, a charge imbalance generated when you measure this circuit. Uh, I used, again, an RF squid, sorry, John, to uh, measure this. And we saw this uh, very precipitous drop near the transition temperature, an indication of the generation of charge imbalance by this effect. Um, it was a wonderful year at Cambridge. Uh, at this point, I didn't drink very much wine, not very good wine. And I mostly drank English bitter beer, sherry, and port, which was the tradition in, in England. Uh, but at Christmas, John Clark popped in. John, as you most, mostly know, is from Cambridge. And he came uh, to visit the lab. And I started to talk to John. And at that point occurred what may be the shortest interview in the history of, of physics. Um, John said, here's how it went. John said, do you want to come to Berkeley? And I said, OK, sure. <laughs> and that was the interview. There were no letters. There were no applications. Um, I guess John Waldrum said I was OK. And so uh, I loaded up the car at the end of the summer, and I went off to Berkeley. Now, when I got there, John wasn't there. He was on sabbatical. But that happened a lot. So, uh, but other people were there. And I worked on two projects. I worked on a really interesting experiment with John Maiman, who's sitting over here. Uh, John, in some sense, was my first graduate student, if you want to put it that way, because I kind of adopted him from John. Uh, and we actually did an extension of the thermoelectric experiment. We put on probes, and we could measure the spatial decay of the charge imbalance near this interface. It's a really fun time. I also worked with the late Roger Koch and John, a really great, the three of us had a really great uh, team. We published a lot of papers. 
And we did a lot of things, but mainly what we studied was how zero point fluctuations can be observed in Joseph's injunctions. This is the spectrum deduced from measuring the noise in Joseph's injunctions, and you can see it goes up uh, linearly in frequency. Uh, this actually sets the limit for the quantum limit for squids, and at that time we were getting down to a few h bar, very close to the quantum limit uh, for squid devices. And so uh, when I was uh, a little bit later, I should say that this experiment I showed, found in a paper which was actually pur uh, purported to be the first measurement of dark energy. And so these people came to visit us, and I think John also, uh, and they wanted us to do experiments. And so I was very proud to have my name on a cos or our, my data in a cosmology experiment, but I did what I usually did. I asked Tony Leggett if this made any sense, and he said, no, probably not. So, um, but at least uh, it's recorded here as the first measurement of dark energy. Uh, so at Berkeley, I learned about squids, I learned about microfabrication, uh, other kinds of fabrication of devices, noise measurements, and I learned a lot about wine. I learned that John traveled a lot. Now, one day he went east, we thought he was going to IBM, and he came back with his wife, Greta. And at that point, the, quali the, group, uh, the quality of the food at parties and at John's home became instantly much better. It became a really nice place to be. John didn't hang around in the evening every night, he went home. And I think it was a really good time for the rest of us postdocs. <laughs> um, I also got to travel to many conferences where I met a lot of physicists. And here's a couple old pictures I pulled. Uh, you recognize John in the middle. This is Greta and Elizabeth, who was about a couple weeks old. Uh, this is Albert Schmidt. I think this is his wife. Correct, John? And this is Hans Moy. And this was at Pistum, I think. And, um, this was a dinner we had. You recognize a few people here. That's me with a beard, Dan Seligson. This is Tom Lemberg, a very young Tom Lemberg. Where's Tom? He's somewhere. I hope. Nope. I don't see Tom. And John and Greta. Uh, so I still did not drink coffee, uh, but John asked me every single day when we went to lunch. And John went to lunch almost every day, and that's something I learned from him. I still go to lunch with my group. It's where you can learn a lot about what's going on in the group and other things. And every single day he said, John, he, John would say, Dale, do you want coffee? And I said, John, I don't drink coffee. Okay, this will come back later. Okay, I got a position at the University of Illinois, and I went off to Urbana. So at Urbana, I was there my first 20 years. I'll divide my career into two pieces. Uh, I worked on many things, and almost all of them involved squids, one form or another. I did low-frequency noise injunctions and squids. I worked on superconducting arrays. I worked on scanning squid microscopy. I worked on measurements of current phase relations, something I learned from John Waldrum, which is really just a squid circuit, interferometer circuit, uh, SFS junctions, pi junctions. And probably the experiment our group is most known for is experiments on un unconventional superconductors. We developed this Josephson interferometer technique, which is really just a squid. It's a squid wrapped around the corner, and you can measure the anisotropy of the order parameter. Um, John didn't, wasn't directly involved in this experiment. But in fact, as I did the experiment, I realized that everything I'd ever learned from him made this experiment possible. And in fact, I very deliberately didn't tell him about this experiment, because I realized if I told him anything, he could go back and do it instantly. It took about two minutes to explain to him what this experiment was. Okay, so John's influence on the style and the substance of my research is really clear, it was really significant, still is really significant. Um, I realized that UIUC is a wonderful place to do physics, uh, but the wine, the food, the scenery uh, were all lacking in some ways. So I took a sabbatical and I went back to Berkeley. So on sabbatical, and this was in the uh, early 2000s, 2000, 2001, I took a sabbatical to Berkeley. John looked a little older then at that point, I think. Um, and uh, we did a really nice experiment involving a lot of people who are here. Uh, Tim Robertson, Britton, uh, John, myself. Um, and this was to look at the effects of, of critical current fluctuations to decoherence in, in flux qubits, actually all Joseph's injunction qubits. The basic idea is the fluctuation of the critical current changes the frequency. You could actually model that if you put in one over F noise for that or some other spectrum. You could model that by figuring out how you would measure the uh, decay of the, uh, the, the quantum state and you can model and get these decoherence times. And um, I think it was a really nice demonstration of how noise, uh, uh, direct noise in a junction could influence qubits. Turns out that most qubits are not limited by critical current noise. In fact, Joseph's injunctions are extremely good. And so there are still tests here that really haven't been done, I think. But 
Uh, it was really a fun time. Uh, it was a great time in the group. Uh, I learned about qubits, decoherence, Japanese baseball, thanks Robert, uh, and walnut prawns, thanks to Sherry. So I um, learned a lot of neat things. I learned to cross country ski rather badly, but uh, here's John, my wife Judy, and myself up at uh, Bear Mountain, I think. Is that what it is? Bear, Bear, Valley. Bear Valley, right? Um, my wife Judy discovered good red wine when we were in the Napa Valley. This was really good for our quality of our life, but this has cost me a lot of money over the years. <laughs> she went from a white, sweet white wine drinker to a heavy cab expensive wine drinker. It happens. Uh, I became a cappuccino drinker, and this happened quite by accident. John may not even realize this story, but when I showed up at Berkeley uh, on sabbatical, we went to lunch the first day, and John said, Dale, do you, would you like some coffee? And I said, John, I don't, I, yes, I would love some. <laughs> and that changed my life because I became a cappuccino drinker. I just couldn't put up with this for a whole other year of hearing him say this. Uh, and so we had a party. That's the other thing we did in the Clark Group. When anything happened good, anything happened bad, we had a party. Uh, there I am sporting my squid shirt. And lots of other people you'll see here who are at this meeting, uh, Sherry and Britton and who else in there, uh, Tim and Robert. And uh, it was just a really wonderful time. And for some reason, I went back to Illinois. I'll never quite understand that, but I did. Um, so back in Illinois, a lot of things happened. I became department head. Administration happens, right, Steve? <laughs> um, uh, other things didn't happen. One was a solution to high TC. High TC lingered on. We started to work on the pseudo gap, the pair density wave state, and we're still now measuring these states using squids and current phase relations. Uh, I did some unusual things I'm doing now, squid magnetometry of monopoles and spin ices, harking back to an old experiment by Blas Cabrera back in the uh, early 80s, 70s maybe. Um, but mostly we focused on qubits, measuring critical current fluctuations. I was very fortunate to be part of the Berkeley Carlsruhe Illinois IARPA group team, which I always uh, privately referred to as the Berkeley Travel Grant, because it allowed me to come back here and visit uh, Berkeley and John as often as I could. Uh, but the new thing I've been doing is to work on topological superconductors and Majorana fermions, um, which is a way to avoid the dephasing. We haven't heard much about that at this meeting, but I also go to meetings at places like Microsoft Q, a lot of activity there. Uh, so um, what I'm working on now is phase coherence and Josen phenomena in hybrid superconductor topological insulator devices, which is another good application, it turns out, of cappuccino cups, as you can show this picture, which is, shows the topology effects. So I think uh, we all know a lot of systems have been proposed to talk about topological, uh, the, the topological systems that might support Majorana fermions, um, I think the one that's gotten the most attention are superconductor or semiconductor nanowires with proximity-induced superconductivity. But the one that we've been interested in is this uh, proximity-induced uh, superconductor topological insulator superconductor junction structure. Now, the reason we like this structure is a lot of people don't like this structure. Nanotubes are much more stable in terms of their Majorana fermions. Um, these are two-dimensional devices. They have multiple channels. They have multiple surfaces. They have conducting states. They have a lot of things that make them not good candidates to support these Majorana excitations, which um, are, are interesting because they have these, supposed to have these non-abelian statistics. That's not been verified, but believed to be the case. Uh, but they have a lot of advantages, too. Uh, they will support the excitations without a strong magnetic field, which you need for nanowires, which allows you to do a lot of the things I like to do, phase-sensitive Josephs and interferometry experiments. It allows you access to the barrier. You can go into a lateral junction and do things like spectroscopies to learn about the device. You can easily expand it into networks. There's lots of ways to control the Majorana fermions, as I'll mention, and there are many schemes proposed to braid and perform logical operations. So this all came from some work by Liang Fu and Charlie Kane, uh, and the basic idea is in a Josephson junction, when you tune the phase, you create states. There are Andre uh, bound states in the junction. This is their spectrum. You can calculate the uh, supercurrent contribution from each of those. And there are two interesting sets of states. One are very low energy states, high transparency states, where this gap is very small. And they give rise to current phase relation terms that are non-sinusoidal, but still two pi periodic, things with extra higher harmonics. They give a skewed CPR, leaned over CPR. 
But then there are these states of the Majorana states that are allowed because of the topological protection of the topological insulator on the surface. And these states have uh, zero energy, and they have a sine phi over two contribution to the current phase relation, which is four pi periodic. If you apply a magnetic field to such a junction, then what happens is you uh, form these Josephs and vortices, and the Majorana fermions are only stable at the location of the cores of the Josephs and vortices. In other words, at the places of phase gradient across the junction, at places where the phase is uh, an integral modulable of uh, pi, an odd modulable of pi, you form these Majorana states. There's one at the top, one at the bottom of the junction. They come in pairs. And uh, if you uh, do things like apply a current to the junction, or say in zero field and you apply a field, they enter vortice, they, the vortices enter the junction like flux enters a, a superconductor, so you can uh, change the density of the Majorana fermions, or the, of the vortices that are tagged to the, uh, uh, which, and the Majorana fermions are attached to those. Uh, if you apply a, cur a critical current, they shift a little bit, and in that case, the Majorana fermioners enter alternatively, one from the left, one from the right. So this, uh, this uh, picture where you have these Majorana fermion states inside the junction give, a, give uh, a lot of ideas about how to image whether this is really true or not. We're thinking of experiments with STM where you could image the zero bias state by scanning along the junction. Uh, you can put tunnel junctions, which we're trying to do now, and actually make discrete measurements of these states. Uh, but the most important thing is you can move them. If you know they're attached to the vortices, we know how to manipulate the vortices in these circuits. So if you apply a voltage across the junction, the Josephson vortices move, they drag the Majorana fermions, and if you do a quick calculation in our junctions, they move at something like a kilometer per second. And so this gives you the possibility of perhaps moving them along and braiding them very rapidly in some kind of interconnected circuit. So here's actually a, a surface code from Liang Fu and his collaborators, one of them, uh, VJ from here. Uh, and, um, uh, this is actually our uh, set of Josephs injunctions, and so these channels represent barriers of Josephs injunctions, and the Majorana fermions can be moved around in this circuit by various kinds of phase and current and voltage perturbations. Now, the question is, is there any evidence for these Majorana states? And we think there is. And it comes from, what else? Josephs and interferometry. If you measure the diffraction pattern of the junctions, you take a look at this, and it says, well, that's a Fraunhofer pattern, as it should be. But in fact, you'll notice that the node, the first node is lifted, the second node is very hard. Here's another case. First node is lifted, second node is very hard. If you apply gating to this, you can change what is really, we think, the sine phi term that, that applies here. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the, the peak of the critical current decreases dramatically, but the nodes don't change, which suggests that whatever is causing the critical current at this first node is different from what's causing the critical current everywhere else in the junction. So one thing you might ask is, does this persist, even odd? And so here's an example of a junction we've measured recently. And you can see here is a blow up. The first note is lifted. Second note is hard. Third note is lifted. Fourth note is hard. Fifth note is lifted. And so we think this even odd effect uh, persists in many junctions we measure. Now, not all, because as I think everyone realizes, if you trap a vortex somewhere in this device, you can lift all the nodes. But this even odd effect is pretty unusual. But one way to get it is by invoking a sine phi over two term, rather trivially. You only cancel the critical current if both these terms cancel. That'll be at the, uh, the even nodes, the even uh, magnetic flux in the junction. The, the odd nodes will be lifted. Now, this is not a good picture because you don't expect a uniform sine phi over two term. And so we have a picture where we have uh, only, we have uh, a current phase relation which is sinusoidal across most of the junction, and only where the Majorana fermion sits, which are these odd multiples of pi, do you get a burst of sine phi over two. And so the overall current phase relation looks like this, looks sinusoidal, a little burst here, a little burst here, and this is four pi periodic. And if you model that, just put it back in, you can get this even odd lifting, you can also put it into squids. We've measured DC squids with this effect as well. Um, OK, so the first question people always ask is, how do you see this? Well, you see it for two reasons. One, we can use the cancellation, uh, use the squid as an interferometer to cancel most of the sine phi over the sine phi component, all the boring part. And the only part that persists at the node is what's left over, the sine phi over two part. Uh, the second thing is you would expect rapid parity transitions. Majorana fermion pairs have a parity. It switches back and forth. Uh, that should change the sign and cancel everything out. But if you go fast enough, 
uh, we, at which we do by measuring this in the finite voltage state so the phase is not static. It's winding. You can, you can see this term. And you can actually use that, we hope, to marry the, measure the parity lifetime. Now, the interesting thing is the parity, which is what you want to measure, is encoded in the sign of this sine phi over 2 component. So we're trying lots of ways to measure the parity. Uh, one of them is a familiar experiment. We're doing the, essentially the old MQT experiment. You wrap up the critical current. You look for a switch to the critical current state. There should be two critical currents, one when the system is in the higher, when the Majorana state has a positive parity, one when it has a negative parity. We're doing this in collaboration with Alexei Bezradin at the University of Illinois. Uh, and uh, we are, in fact, seeing some evidence for what you would expect a bimodal distribution, so that this would be the upper critical current, the sum, this would be the difference critical current. But we're not sure yet whether this is due to vortices uh, trapped in the junction, which may also support Majorana fermions, or due to this uh, effect we're looking for. Um, uh, one nice thing is if you know how to move the vortices, you can do things like braiding. So here's a trijunction, uh, three Josephson junctions, and I color-coded the vortices just for convenience. So you apply a magnetic field, so these are the Josephson vortices in the sample. If I apply a one-flux quantum pulse using something like rapid single-flux quantum logic, from this electrode to these two, all these vortices will move over by one unit cell, by one period of the vortices. If I do that again and then do it again, you can see that what I've done is exchange those two vortices. And so I can do a braiding operation simply by shifting these. And so if you can read the parity of these devices in some way, you can perhaps test some of these braiding ideas. Uh, you can also do braiding in other ways. You can move them around in these channels, these interconnected channels. If you go faster or slower, again, you can exchange these vortices. OK, so the conclusion to my science part of the talk here is that we like this lateral Josephson junction system. We think there's some evidence for the 4 pi periodic component. Uh, if, if it's there and you can manipulate it, you can read it out by measuring this sine phi over 2 term. And there are lots of ways to perhaps exchange and braid things. But let me get to my real conclusion. The real conclusion is, about three or four years ago, uh, John and I were both in Cambridge, and I had the great honor of giving a talk at the 50th anniversary of the Josephson effect. Now, Brian didn't really understand the Josephson effect is how it's, how it's evolved very well, because he kind of got out of the business. Um, but it was a really interesting conference, and we all told him how important it was. I made a list of every experiment I've ever done, and almost every one of them involved the Josephson effect. Nice shirt, isn't it? I like that. <laughs> um, in preparing this talk, I realized that almost everything I do, both in my research and in my life, has been greatly influenced by John. His friendship, his mentoring, his uh, papers. Uh, uh, and uh, this, is, this is the way I like to see John, with a glass of wine in front of him. Hope that happens tonight, right, John? <laughs> Uh, so what I, 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 I watered down everything I've learned to three rules of life here. So the first is you start every day with a cappuccino in a real cup. No paper cups for John. Just want to let you know that. Second thing is you end every day with a lot of good red wine when I try to do that. And the third thing is I don't think there is any experiment that can't be done better with a squid. <laughs> this is how I've lived my life. And so thank you, John, for everything. And thanks to all of you. Well, thank you. So, time for questions? Yes. Can you say anything about the coherence of the Majoranas? Because the big excitement of the Marijuana. This is, of course, the hope that it's protected and that it's infinitely, almost infinitely coherent. That's very unlikely, I would think, in your system. It's pretty unlikely, I think, in any system, but, but I think uh, that's a good point. So the Majoran exchange itself does not have any errors. And so in one exchange, there really is no error. And the whole point is you can make a qubit, all the things we've been hearing about, with a lot less error correction. Now, will there be none? No, I don't think so, because there's always going to be parity transitions. And so parity transitions do set a lifetime. 
in things like nanowires, that's thought to be very long, maybe as long as seconds or, or milliseconds. Uh, in this system, we would think not so much, but we can also go very fast. So I think in all systems, and you're going to want to go fast anyway because you want to do a lot of logical operations. So um, I think there, there are going to be a, an equivalent. Th that field is much more in its infancy. It's where this field was when you did your first experiments. We weren't sure if you would see entanglement, if you would see microscopic quantum tunneling. I think some people, I'm a believer, but not everyone believes that the, the, the nanowires are showing Myron and Fermions. I do, but um, a lot, nobody has demonstrated anything to do with non-abelian statistics yet, and that's the important thing. Um, but there's a lot of good physics there, and I think you will run into some limitation very much like qubits do. There'll be some lifetime, you'll have to go fast, you'll have to deal with all those things. It's an alternative world, and I think it's a really fun one right now. Um, hi. Uh, how do you dis, uh, distinguish the phi over two term that you get from forward skewed uh, channels from the four pi periodicity of the Majorana fermion channels? Um, I think that's the same thing. Am, am I missing something? I'm not sure what you're asking. The, so what we've done is an experiment. We think there's evidence for a phi over, a sine phi over two term in the current phase. We can't prove that comes from Majoranas. I think that proof will come when you braid. In fact, it will only come when you braid and, develop and, and demonstrate non-abelian statistics. Um, but um, we think the evidence shows there's something sine phi over two, but we've learned in Josephson effects not to assume anything that you see is from a particular effect. Good. Um, any further questions? We should probably move on to the next talk anyway. Uh, good. Thanks again.